Jesus. He's good for the black one. The main idea would be that 
This thing comes with a phase. Just the moment of our final state. So there's a phase. So the phase of this form factor is telling us about the enormous dimension. But because it's a phase, there's an optical theorem which allows us to compute it using unitarity. So if you take this form factor for trace of f square, you want to calculate its imaginary part at one point. You get to cut, to make a cut where you have a three-level amplitude, two to two scaling amplitude on one side of the cut. So the equation, you get to integrate this three amplitude over phase space times this form factor, and this form factor is just some polynomial which I'm going to show later. So basically integral over the three amplitude. So how do we actually do this practice? Well first we need the expression for the three amplitude and it has this familiar Park Taylor form. Uh, the tree amplitude it has a very specific color structure. We don't need the uh, color order one, but we need the one for color singlet because f trace of f squared is a trace in it, but it given by the formula basically. And what we have this amplitude, we have to do the phase space integral. And one may be a bit worried because normally we phase space when you wait over angles, but when we have these spinners, uh, you know, we have to think for one second more. And actually, the, there's a very elegant parameterization which is Speedball, which allows us to do phase space integral in terms of, you parameterize the intermediate state in terms of a rotation of the spinners. You do the same thing for the anti-spinner, the lambda tildes, and that, uh, that parameterization preserve, uh, no, it's, uh, preserves total momentum. So this parameterizes phase space and theta is just a scattering angle. <coughs> you plug this parameterization into the amplitude and now we just get the function of the angles. So, yeah, subject. So we just have to take this function of the angle we integrate, and to compute this imaginary part of the form factor, which would give us an dimension. We just integrate it over angle. And, and here, it's important that this is ratio. So on the first line, that's a form factor for f squared. Give us something. Form factor for t gives us a slightly different numerator, we'll explain in a second. And what's important is that both of them are, are both of these integral diverge. This is precisely the point where we took this ratio. When we took this ratio, the divergence nicely cancelled, and we is finite, we get a number, and it's a number that all of us like and memorize. And this is, of course, the newest mention of S square, as I mentioned, is not to be related, uh, it's closely related to the beta function. It's not exactly the same, so there's an interesting difference which show up in the formula. So this, this kind of formula we derived a while ago. I think people use it a lot in X physics, for example, because X coupled to QCD like F squared also. So this, uh, anyway, so there's, there's a formula which relates the two. And when you plug in this formula, you get the better function, which is the correct one, with the correct sign, and, and everything. So it's nice, it works. So the message here is that the better function you need is you can think of it as we go back. So this is very simple 2 to 2 3 amplitude here, and the better function is just an eigenvalue of it. And of course, it's a bit mundane to say it at an emphasis talk, but of course we didn't need any cokes or anything, just, just physical calculation. Uh, we can comment on the sign also. So, this, the reason the, so the emphasis tension was essentially minus 1 over pi times the scattering amplitude. The approach. And the scattering amplitude is positive, and that reflects the fact that uh, gluons attract each other. So the sign of the amplitude means something. It means that there's an attraction. You can think of the I uh, uh, can think of it, well, can write it a little bit. Basically, uh, right, S is equal to 1 plus IM. I can think of it as X plus phase, and this phase is like minus in your energy. So if M is positive, that means you have negative interaction energy. So M positive means attraction. So that's why the sign comes up. So it's kind of nice. And the main goal of this talk would be to try to systematize and extend the story to our lives. So, let me briefly mention on the related work. So this does not come out of, no out of nowhere. So, one previous iteration on the story was by Arkany Ahmed, Cachazo and Katan a few years ago, where they look at the uh, Essentially, in the framework of generalized unitarity, when you calculate the one loop amplitude, uh, the, entire, the total divergences are related to the sum of so-called bubble coefficients. And they, they devise a kind of 
you can divide the formula for this for the sum over bubbles, and, and, and by computing it, they, they show that you get uh, this number. Uh, well, and, and yeah. But it, yeah. And some other inspiration was the was the long story about the one-loop dilatation of our door in N course 4, which talked in the very influential paper by Weibel in 2011, where the 2 to 2 S matrix when course 4 was identified as the dilatation as the one-loop dilatation of our door. And this formula, as far as I understand, was basically for yes by symmetries. I mean, the, people said, well, the dilatation operator is something that does all the n equals 4 super conformal symmetry, and the empty suit also was, so the good be equal to each other. <laughs> this was the spirit. But then it was understood by Matthias Quitten, who started looking under the hood of this, that well, really, you could understand this much more directly using generalized integrity for form factors. And then the yang yang symmetries and so on can be understood. Uh, this gives a nice map between the symmetries of the amplitude and the symmetries of dilatation. In the parallel development, uh, this kind of picture were used to understand the, uh, certain patterns. So people did calculation of uh, another dimension and running of dimension six operators that you could have to the standard model. So it was a long series of, of papers and these others. And and you do this complicated Feynman graph calculation, and they got a lot of zeros where at certain place they, nobody expected these zeros. And as uh, Chung and Shen pointed out, these zeros could, could be understood nicely in the unitarity type framework by, from the fact that scaling absolute for all plus and just one minus vanish. So that gives you some selection rules that you will never guess otherwise. So, kind of a nice story. And here, what we're adding to this story is, well, we're not going to use generalized unitarity, it's going to be plain standard unitarity. This is just the optical theorem that, that we used earlier at the beginning of this talk. And instead of having a product of two, ampl two amplitudes like that, it will always be one, three on one side, and it will be a form factor on the other side. So that makes the phase space integral much more, much easier to do, because the, the tree is basically a polynomial. And the other improvement is that Whenever people draw this kind of picture, you have to disentangle the ultraviolet and the infrared divergences. The answer does both. And the trick, as, as, as I already introduced, is to use the stress tensor to control the infrared divergence. Because the, because the stress tensor doesn't have any ultraviolet divergence, this will always separate uh, <coughs> them. And really, when you put all the, these ideas together, so we just check it, it does work for QC. So, so let me say a bit more about the, the stress tensor before, before we move on. So we consider this infrared safe ratio. And as I said, the reason to divide our stress tensor it does, is that it doesn't have any ultraviolet directions on the infrared. And actually, this dominator is quite important. If you look at the theory, like if you want to look at the fermion contribution of this uh, in QCD, or suppose you want to do a QED calculation, in QED you will find the numerator, the numerator basically has zero because Run, uh, sorry, photons don't really interact with each other. So actually, in QED, the whole better function will come from the denominator of this formula. But uh, you can calculate this, this, this denominator, and, and what you need basically is the form factor for, for the stress tensor. It's fixed by bars. You can not have to compute it from, you, can, you could compute it from textbooks, from find some formulas, but you can just write it down using this good principle, like it has to be not, the normalization is meaningful. Uh, energy and momentum is conserved, uh, it has to be polynomial in, in, in spinners with specific weight, so gluons is just one thing you can write down. And okay. uh, as usual, the gluon expression is nice and beautiful, fermion expression is slightly more conversant, and the scalar one sucks. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so let's just look a bit more about this formula. Uh, so essentially, this form factor here. Is if I go back a few slides, this is what uh, I inserted here to get this uh, this cosine to the eight. So why, where did this cosine to the eight came from? Uh, it's because you have to take this form factor, you have to rotate it, you have to evaluate it at this rotated thing. So you get this factor of cosine here, and the sines of the compute because of some some phases. So you get four powers of cos from the form factors, and you also get four four factors of cos on the specific factor, which is not 1, 2, but it's something like 1, 3 to the 4th, or, or sorry, 1, 4 to the 4th, or the stress tensor. That's how you get the 8. That's basically all there is to it. So this is a calculation you can 
it can be done. I think it can always be done at the level of uh, you know, uh, uh, a course in field theory. I mean, the only things you need to introduce are this amplitude and spin or notation, and, and, uh, and that, that's essentially it. Uh, okay. So, so as, I, as I promised, let's try to see what we can say at higher group. So, the, new, the, first, the first thing we need is some kind of relation between imaginary part or some, something which relates to energy dependence to some phase. And the way we're going to derive such a relation is we're going to start from a form factor where all the articles are outgoing. We'll just, produce, we'll just insert some s or something and it's producing a bunch of stuff. And the trick is going to be we do a complex scale transformation like this, we just rotate all the momenta by some phase. And if we look here, the point is that by doing this, uh, by adding this phase, you can reach point backward, and uh, as you f after you rotate by pi, what you get is you go back to the same amplitude with minus the momenta, but you're on the wrong side of the cut, so you have the complex contour. And the point is that this rescaling is generated by the dilatation operator. You just put an I in front of the dilatation and you generate this crossing. So we have this relation here. <coughs> come from a uh, rotated from the amplitude in this complex sponge state. And the other thing we need is a version of the optical theorem. So, this is so that we have a bit on the slide for the moment. The standard optical theorem, which is basically just saying that this S matrix is unitary. And that, that turns into some relation for imaginary parts and so on. And okay, I just can give a sketchy argument, but if you think if, what we need is some relation like that for form factor. So you can try to look at textbooks and so on, I didn't find one, but you can try to, to, to make up one. And the basic idea is you think of a form factor as a perturbation of the of, of the S matrix. Because indeed if you add something to your action, you're changing the S matrix by a little bit. And then if you impose that unitary is preserved, then you get a relation like that. And where F is some matrix. But if you just restrict to having final state, it's no longer a matrix, one S drops out, and you get this relation. So what's the me message? The message is this. So you combine these two things, analysis D and unitarity together, you get this relation, which you can read as follows. You can basically cancel F star in this relation and read that. Uh, the dilatation operator is minus the phase of the S matrix divided by pi. <coughs> so this is the relation that effectively we, we've checked in, the, in, in QCD at the beginning. It's the first time in my life that I have an equation that they can actually write in words. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, let me see how much time do I have? So, let me just say more about uh, this idea of the phase of the S matrix. So, we can look at more, inter more complicated operators or more interesting ones than, uh, than F squared. So, for example, twist two operators. And you can ask how they're related to the phase of the S matrix. And okay, let's, let's write some, some scalar field theory, for example, let's write some operator like that, where plus is some like one direction. If we model by total derivatives, which is the interesting thing normally, can do it by putting the two momenta so up to zero, and then we let consider minimal form factor or two. So that the, the, the general picture here is that instead of thinking about these operators, we're just thinking about this polynomial. From this view, from the viewpoint of this Anshel approach, operators are labeled by polynomials. Give me a polynomial, that's an operator. So twist two operators without this polynomial. Where M is a spin. If you just plug this, uh, this polynomial into this uh, rotation, so you have to evaluate, you, when you do the phase space integral, you have to rotate this, this polynomial. It doesn't rotate as as, as you, you would think, and one of, one of the issues is that uh, uh, you might worry that when, you, when we've gone to this forward direction, the total momentum is zero. You're still trying to use unitarity, but it's a bit weird because uh, this channel is now space-like, it's not time-like anymore. But the amazing thing about, a very clever thing about this Weibull parameterization is that it works even if it's just an integral over angles. It doesn't matter at all whether they are uh, space-like or time-like, you can just do an integral. You're just integrating with a polynomial, it doesn't matter at all. 
And when you plug in, you get something like that. And that just looks completely random. But actually, when you integrate over a immutable angle, you just get a legend polynomial. But you get this essentially the absolute weighted by a legend polynomial. So, so this is what a, a uh, uh, I guess in old notebooks, absolute weighted by a legend polynomial are called partial waves. Uh, those of us who stuff uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics recently, may remember what a partial wave is. Well, the other one is essentially a way to diamond like to, to, to scattering like going to uh, angular momentum basis. So M is the angular momentum and, and, and then you just project M to, into that angular momentum. This is the so twist two operators correspond to this, two particles in a specific state of angular momentum. You can do this in QCD and just check if it works. So QCD, it's a bit more tricky because gluons have spin so we don't get simple legend polynomials. And it looks complicated, so you have to work out some group theory uh, problem to figure out what polynomials to use. But actually, with this Weibull parameterization, you just don't have to do any work. You, now your, your form factor is this polynomial in spinners, that's your state, plug in this rotation, you see you get a slightly different polynomial. Now it's n minus 2 and n plus 2 instead of n, n. So that, that immediately tells you what the generalization of legend polynomial is, particles with spin. I'll have to look up from old papers from the 60s or something. <laughs> I have no idea where, where, where you find such formulas. But anyway, then you actually do the integral and you check it produce exactly the endless dimension of these two operators. So, the phase shift in QCD they do give you the uh, the gap equation, the twist to an endless dimension. So, it does work. Oh, one thing I should have asked, I, I've designed this talk to be a relatively light talk, so if anyone has a question, just feel free to interrupt. Uh, so, here's time for a warning. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I just did at, at one loop to, to, to project the 2 to 2 amplitude onto partial waves, it's not going to work at two loops. And the point is that. Uh, in the formula that I said, that the phase of the S matrix divided by pi times minus 1 is equal to the dilatation operator, that formula, the S matrix is an operator. So the phase of the S matrix is, is not the same as the phase of some matrix element. Because we have to diagonalize it in principle. So you have all this mixing which matters. So if you want to compute this, uh, this dilatation operator at two loop, you have to include not just this naive thing, which would be the phase of 2 to 2 scattering, one loop, but you also have to compute the correction to the state and also the mixing with uh, two and three. So <laughs> beware. <laughs> and if you try to just include this, you will not get the right answer at right. <laughs> try. So another thing that's important to mention is that the dilatation operator is not exactly the endless dimension. Well first of all it's endless dimension in the UV plus the one in the IR, but even beyond that it's the endless, because of the, if the coupling runs, it's the endless dimension average over that circle that I drew up a few ago. So, of course, if you know the better function at the lower loop, you can figure out how much the average is different from, from the value that you want. But it's important to that in mind. Uh, so, yeah, so, with that makes sense, so I, the general framework, I think, to, to go to our loop is quite clear. But before we, we, we just jump into this, we just, I think it's good to, to, to completely clean up the ground for this one loop, uh, well, to explore more one loop, one loop in more general uh, theories. And actually, in Yukawa's theory, some more uh, kind of interesting things can be seen. The basic feature about Yukawa theories is that the, the couplings are harder to measure. In QCD, we just have to look at this form factor for two blue ones. Yukawa theory, we have to look at, uh, say, uh, the Yukawa coupling, you have to look at two fragments plus a scalar, that's three particles. Or 5 4, you have the 5 4 coupling, you have to look at four scalars. So, so from the viewpoint of the Zanshell approach, it, it, it's harder to measure. And I think that reflects to some level uh, a difficulty in measuring experimentally with these couplings. It's, it's not completely independent. But uh, in Yukawa, it's different. we have to work a bit harder because of this issue about the lengths. Uh, then yeah, we want to investigate possible circuit. So we're just going to look uh, on the rest of this talk at some theory with one real scalar and one wide vermion, so five, four, two, one. Theory, and in this theory, the endless dimension is going to be some matrix, so 
mixing between these two guys. If we look at just the learned thing that uh, we mentioned before. So, the basic thing we need, again, as before, is matrix elements. Uh, the basic ones are this. From this, you can construct all the two to two scatterings. I will not, not show them. And essentially, from there, it's the same recipe. The basic point is uh, the two to two scattering amplitude, its eigenvalues, times minus one over pi gives you a numbers dimension. You have collinear divergences. There's no stuff divergences here, but you still have collinear divergences in this theory. And you can extract them by looking at the matrix element for a stress, taking matrix element for a stress tensor to two scalars that give you the scalar numbers dimension. The fermion, you get the fermion numbers dimension. So you can get the corneal numbers dimension from the stress tensor. And after, after you subtract these, you isolate the region. So that way you get all the diagonal elements of that mixing matrix. Well, the off diagonal ones, you get one order. So the leading one, which goes uh, uh, below the diagonal, uh, it turns out that if you try to, to put this, this form factor here, and, and at, at, lead, at one loop, if you try to make one of these legs disappear, you'll need something like a 2 to 1 amplitude. And that just doesn't, you know, a 2 to 1 cut, it, that, that doesn't exist. You know, if you have a massless particle, it, you cannot have a cut, which is one particle of cut. But you cannot, you could not like. Uh, <coughs> if you start from 5 4, you could not draw something like uh, like, like that at uh, that point if, uh, if this leg is on shell. <coughs> if this leg because if this leg is on shell, uh, it's no phase space. So you so you don't have any at one loop. You don't have any uh, matrix element below the diagonal. But at two loop you can because you can draw some three to two one uh, amplitude. So here you see this there's a three to two amplitude there. I divide it over these three bars that cut. And because it's Yukawa theory, the integrals will not be really simple. Of course, all two integrals are can automate them and so on. But uh, uh, here it's actually simple enough that you can, with some explicit parameterization of the, of the spinners, that are inspired by Weaver's one, I think it was written down by Weaver that's for this one, you can actually do the integral. And, uh, uh, the thing I want to spend more time on is the fact that Look at the upper triangular element. Naively, it's a one-loop calculation, so it should be. Uh, uh, we might think it's easier than the, than the, the other ones. But what happens is that so here you have to use when you when you look at this cut, for example. So, right, it's unitarity. You have to sum the raw cut this guy. When you look at this cut, what happens is you have to use a non-minimal form factor. There's a propagator here. It gives rise to some something downstairs. So a propagator here on the other side. And these propagators mean that when you do the integral, there's a chance that you get a little blob. And actually, you do get some blob. So it's disturbing because, you know, when then the, the numerous dimension of a local operator is supposed to give you another local, local operator, which is a polynomial. You get this log. It's very disturbing. But then you know, then you don't use open, you just add all the cuts. And what you find when you do it is that the log nicely cancels and you get this. Constant as we were expected. So, so it works, and we can put this into some matrix. And as far as I understand, this matrix is uh, uh, compared with some other ones in the literature, and, and, and it's very for the uh, final calculation and, and agreement. And yeah, the reason I just want to explain the reason I call this off diagonal elements uh, one loop and a half is that if you care about something like the eigenvalue of the matrix, because it's zero down here, it's down here. Of diagonal elements on the effect diagonal value of two. That's why I call this thing. These two elements are like one and a half. But if you want diagonal values, you just need the diagonal ones, and this is from two to two scale. So okay, so we see this length changing effects in action here. Uh, we extract the better function from that. So we need some kind of generalization of this. In QCD, which related the dynamics dimension of F square to the running of coupling. So, uh, this formula again can be found in the field theory textbook. The so formula basically then is mentioned our derivative of better function. That's how you relate them in general. Uh, and just give you an interpretation, sketch of derivation of this formula. Essentially, the, the physics is that a form factor 
is a small variation of this matrix. Think of, I mean, you have a family, you have a family of S matrices which are parameterized by these couplings. And the RG equation are lines in, this, in, the, in these parameters where the physics is unchanged. So, and if you try, if you, if you commute to this equation that the S matrix, that the form factor generated variation in this matrix, and then you commute this with the RG equation, you get that the must mention that give you a perturbation of the RG fruit. That's why you get this durance in that function. So and you can mathematically derive this formula. And then the one thing I want to stress maybe is that the only input to these formulas are the randomization group equation and, and this equation that relates form factors to, to this matrix, form factor is zero momentum. And there's no, no don't mean like or anything, it's really general. Uh, uh, if, if, you have, if, if you knew how to have the how to derive this axiom, you like that. Uh, then one, one kind of amusing, well, remarkable thing about this formula is that it's kind of over constrained. If you start from gamma, there's more than one ways to get the better function. So if you look at the better function of, of, uh, of the uh, five fourth coupling, for example, there's a term in it that has a cross term of two different coupling constant and you can enter, you can get to it by integrating an dimension matrix in two different ways. You can integrate this term with respect to lambda, or you can integrate this term with respect to y, and you have to get the same, and you need to do it. So it's a, it's a nice consistency check. Uh, at the diagrammatic level, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it seems very striking to me, because, for example, this calculation here, the off diagonal one, you get from this uh, two to three elegantes would be the greater of this cut. And when you do this calculation, you're thinking of this guy as off shell because right, it's a propagator of this two. But the, the other number here uh, comes basically from the anomalous dimension of the scalar from a Fermi loop. That, that's what this graph looked like. But uh, you know, as I said, you cannot cut, uh, cannot put this thing on shell. So the way it happens in this formula is that you get the anomalous dimension by taking matrix element of stress tensor and using this two to two amplitude and dividing by half. I know these two numbers. I think it, it is. Uh, I think this should be understood better. But uh, it's a nice consistency check, and it does work. And um, okay, the, maybe the last thing I want to, to comment on is. Uh, okay, people can ask about masses, because okay, we're doing all this calculation in the massless case. I think it's really, uh, at the fundamental level, it's really is the, is the appropriate thing to use the massless as matrix. And the basic point is that whenever you use a, a normalization group to perform some logs, you already think of a particle as being very light, or it's heavy and you've already integrated that. I mean, there's some transition regions, but you don't, you don't deal with them. With the, uh, you don't perform large logs for transition regions. Uh, so, so that's why it's very really appropriate. And just to give you a concrete example, if you think about a mass operator for some heavy quark, this operator, you think about this running when you're dealing with energies much higher than the heavy quark mass, and below the heavy quark mass, then this operator just is an existing theory. So, so I think it's kind of the, the conventional way that the R number group is used, it's the correct thing to do in this case. <laughs> but uh, one thing that uh, none less concerned that uh, many people have expressed to me is that Puntarity cannot be correct, cannot correctly give you the renormalization group because sometimes you have logs of mass like that. Like a very simple thing, if you have a tan, if you have an antonym mass, if if this propagator is massive, this tan pole integral will give you a divergence. And there's some log, and normally people, well, many people will include that in the renormalization group equation. So, with unitarity, we cannot cut through to this, so we're going to miss this. So, how, 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 is this world, how can this world approach be consistent? So, I just want to address this issue. And actually, it's not a, it's not a problem that, we, that the, we don't see such terms. Because there are only two different, two distinct questions that uh, one can ask. One question is, that, uh, is, what is the optimal value of the bare parameters to use the given cutoff scale. For example, if someone does a lattice simulation, you want to know how to tune your, your coupling the lattice scale. Or in the standard model, if you want to interpret this 
there's couplings of fine tune. A lot of what we want to, we want to, we may want to imagine, they want to ask, but the couplings will be in some putative completion of some putative in this case. But the kind of question would, that uh, uh, the other kind of question that is used, uh, that is more frequently uh, uh, relevant in collider uh, environments, is what is the optical optimal running coupling which will minimize large loads if you calculate the physical observable at a given scale. And these questions are distinct because these kind of constant logs, they don't, they aren't no relevance for the second question. Because once you tune your you know, counter terms and so on, to adjust these coupling at a given scale, it doesn't run anymore. Any an experiment at any energy will not detect any change in this. So so Euteritic correctly answers the second question. So, so you summarize. So the main message, if you to remember something, so the dilatation operator is minus the phase of the S matrix divided uh, by pi that we uh, somehow encoded in that equation. Uh, at one loop, this works very nicely. And essentially, this minus 11 third comes from, as a, you can understand it, as an eigenvalue of this D minus 2. Uh, so, if you didn't like this formula, then that gives you one more, one more reason to uh, <laughs> like it. <laughs> uh, and iron divergence are not a uh, fundamental issue here. You can cancel them using the stress tensor. And you can analyze the KYT with two or one of the uh, some, some question for future work. So, one can ask about the okay, uh, can ask about iron loops very naturally. Uh, Oh, and one can do it already. Well, there's been a lot of work already in course 4, but uh, I think uh, QCD it could be done, it would be interesting. Especially with QCD, if you look at twist 2, when you only have two operators in the final, two, uh, two particles in the final state, it allows us to access all uh, the better function in all twist 2 operators in QCD. This, this should not be any uh, new conceptual issues there, so that, that should be something very nice to look at now. And the nice thing about this, this framework, is that the same matrix elements are govern all, uh, all the spins uh, at the same time. Uh, if you want to look at the, uh, higher twists or more complicated, more, more complicated operators, then there's the issue that the, for leg changing uh, effects of this mysterious cancellation of loads between cuts. And actually, even that if, you have the, if, you have, if you have three scalar fields, or three fields in general, uh, even length preserving effect will have this feature of two loops that always cancel between cuts. So this will have to be understood better. Uh, there's been a lot of work actually already on the, uh, on the two, uh, form factors, but not, not necessarily analyzing the, uh, the entirety. Uh, there's, been, there's been a lot of work, for example, in trying to understand what's the connection between the, the S matrix, uh, yeah. the dilatation operator. And I think one, one kind of mysterious, uh, mysterious, but one way in which the, the, this work here will have uh, some, some new, new insight is that when you look at this formula, you know, the form factor is kind of passive in this equation. In some sense, the dilatation operator is a property of the S matrix. And, and this form factor is only there to provide the eigen, eigen function. So I don't know if that, that can be uh, useful in this context. And another question which I think uh, as a community we may want to ask ourselves is uh, sort of more, ph so the last two are sort of more philosophical. Uh, is, oh, someone hands you the spectrum of the S matrix. So we've already known that the, the spectrum of uh, anomalous dimension in course 4 and now okay, apparently the spectrum is exactly also the spectrum of the S matrix. We don't normally care about, diag uh, about diagonalizing the S matrix. Right? Have a particles want to know what comes out. But suppose someone ends with the spectrum of the S matrix. What, what can we do with it? I think it's a question we may want to ask in the community. And of, of course, uh, something which I added, a question on which I have added absolutely nothing is, which is the main point of the renormalization group, is that the logs exponentiate in some <laughs> specific pattern. Um, some loop calculation gets some log squared and you can predict it from one loop. Uh, can we derive this kind of pattern from actual ideas? So that would be a great thing to understand. Thanks. Do we have any 
any questions? For example, so from the viewpoint of integrity, uh, this 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 doesn't this doesn't succeed in making a direct connection with the two to two S matrix and the one. Uh, somehow there seems to be more information in, in that equation than in that picture. I just wonder if at the multi loop level, you know, you have to in intermediate steps track the IR divergences a lot harder in the four factor approach. Yes, presumably yes. Uh, one loop, I don't think it's uh, in two loop. I don't think it's going to be an issue. But eventually, the point is that the uh, uh, if you only use a stress tensor to uh, to subtract the divergence, you have to look at the matrix element for or the stress tensor to to many particles. This gets more and more complicated. But in principle, the information. Yeah. Other questions? So when you use this stress tensor. This has free Lorentzians. Yes. Uh, doesn't this cause a problem or? Uh, yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, so this ratio, uh, dividing with something uh, against something with indices. Uh, the point is that uh, it's kind of guaranteed that the stress tensor uh, uh, normalizes multiplicatively. So, so when you actually compute the. Uh, Here, when you, uh, sorry. Uh, when, when you compute such a phase space integrality, if you put a stress tensor here, it always comes out that uh, what comes out on the left is proportional to the stress tensor. So it doesn't matter which indices you put, you can always take this ratio. Thank you. 